Well, that was one way to start. Uh, let me share my screen. You will notice that the video said we are landing on February 18th which is really soon. So this is a, a great opportunity. Thank you to uh, the innovators. Thank you to Jay for the and uh, Elizabeth for the opportunity to come share this story of what's been going on with the Mars rovers and specifically with Perseverance. Going to be landing very shortly. So I will try really hard to speak only for 20 minutes to make sure that we have uh, plenty of time for questions. So let's get started. I am still working on the Curiosity rover, which is on Mars. I'll talk about that um, briefly. And I'm also on the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover team. I am the deputy team chief of the engineering operations team. And so I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be working, uh, oops, sorry, fortunate enough to be working on both rovers. So in a non-pandemic world, I would be spending a lot more time at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. So just up the road from where we are. So the rovers are being built, at, the rovers have been built by our partners as well as at JPL. So JPL stands for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We are one of 10 NASA centers that are located around the United States, and we are run for NASA by Caltech. So the California Institute of Technology owns the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, manages it for NASA. And our job within NASA is the robotic exploration of the solar system and beyond. So the different NASA centers have different areas of expertise. When you think of launching spacecraft, you think of the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We train the astronauts in Texas, but JPL's Forte, our, our area of expertise, is the robotic exploration. So before we send people, we send robots. Mars has always had a particular interest for us, as, as uh, usually it's our nearest planetary neighbor. And a number of years ago, if I would show this slide, there were a lot fewer spacecraft and a lot fewer countries. You would see fewer flags around this, uh, around this picture. We started exploring Mars robotically in the 1960s, landed on Mars for the first time in the 1970s with the Viking mission, and we started sending rovers in the 1990s. Right now we have a mix of orbiters and landers. So, and those orbiters come from many different countries. And as you can see on the screen, the orbiters orbit the planet. So they can learn about Mars from orbit, but they can also serve as relays. So this is a very important function where the rovers or the landers that are on Mars can send their data back into orbit and the orbiters can send that information home. We started sending rovers in 1997, and, and that was because our first landing on Mars in 1976 with the Viking landers made it very clear that after a certain point, after you've done a certain amount of exploration from orbit, you want to land and move around. You want to be able to truly explore. So in 97, we sent Pathfinder and the Sojourner rover, and their job was to find out okay, just how do we do this? It was a short mission. It was a technology demonstration where we said, can we land a rover on another planet and how will we control it? Then in 2004, we sent Spirit and Opportunity and those were twin rovers that landed on opposite sides of Mars. And the rovers have both exploration objectives as well as uh, preparing for human exploration. So they have science objectives as well as human exploration objectives. So Spirit and Opportunity were supposed to find out, was there ever uh, liquid water on Mars in the past? Was Mars once more like the Earth in that it had water in the past? And they had, that was their job, was to find out 
was there water there? And the answer to that question was yes. There was water on Mars in the past. And the next rover that we sent that is still there, so the rovers are actually all still there, but Spirit and Opportunity, even though they were designed to last for 90 Martian sols, 90 days approximately, they lasted for six years. Spirit lasted for six years and Opportunity lasted for over 14 years. So for quite a while, we had multiple rovers that were operating simultaneously on Mars. The, uh, Spirit and Opportunity are no longer operating and Curiosity landed in 2012. So she landed in 2012 and actually today is, or I should say to Sol, which I'll explain in a bit, is Sol 3000 on Mars. So Curiosity has been on Mars for 3000 Sols or 3000 Martian days. So I thought I'd share that because that's our, our uh, anniversary today. So Curiosity's job was to find out, okay, if there was water on Mars, was it there long enough to have created the conditions for life, uh, for life in the past? And we're talking about microbial life. And the answer to that is yes. The, we, have, we have accomplished our objective of finding out that Mars once had the conditions for life. So the next step is the Mars 2020 rover. And this rover is again saying, all right, given it what we've learned before, we are to the point where we're now willing to say, Mars was once habitable. So let's actually build a rover to see if we can detect the actual biosignatures, the signs of past life on Mars. If you see, and in this diagram, you can see that Mars 2020, now called the Perseverance rover, looks a great deal like Curiosity, like Mars Science Lab, which is the rover on the left. And that is by design. We want to reuse the capabilities of Mars Science Lab as much as we can because it was a successful Curiosity was and is a successful mission. And so we have changed the payload. So 2020 uh, Perseverance has improved, has, uh, we always seem to carry more and more cameras. We've improved our wheels. But a key difference is that the Perseverance rover is going to do exploration on Mars, but it is actually designed to take samples of Mars, of the regolith, of the soil, of the material there, put it in test tubes, and basically prepare for a Martian sample return. We are going to robotically bring back the materials that we gather from Mars so that they can be examined on Earth. And I'll talk more about that as we, as, as we get further along. So the rover was assembled at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And, you know, and now I look at this, this uh, picture of me in the control room with the rover back here. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but you can see the rover. And this was before she was launched. And, you know, kind of back when wearing a hazmat suit and masks were not something that we all did every day, right? So I suited up and went into one of this is one of the opportunities I had to be in the clean room with the rover uh, before she headed off uh, to Mars. So this is a view of the rover with its different parts. This is the heat shield which will protect us from the atmosphere of Mars when we go in. You can see the rover all tucked up here in the back shell. And this is the cruise stage, the part on the top, in case you can't see my mouse, the part that has the tanks with the gold uh, blankets over it, the gold thermal blankets. That's the part that actually flies us to Mars. So this is the assembled rover, uh, the entire system after literally a decade of work that then uh, that then is getting ready, uh, was uh, launching to Mars. And let's see, let me go to the next slide. So we launched in July of this past year. 
if you will recall, the world shut down, the planet Earth started to shut down in March. It was not clear to us that we would be able to launch given the restrictions and the desire to keep the flight team safe and everyone else safe. So we decided to, you know, who knew when we got our name that it was going to be so applicable. We decided to persevere and try and see with the help of the launch teams, with the help of the uh, the Air Force, the launch teams, all the different, the, the uh, ULA, all the different teams that had to work together in order to allow us to launch. And we were able to continue with by reducing the amount of folks that we had that were involved in person in launch operations to do as much as we could remotely. But obviously, there's a certain amount that you have to do in person and do everything we could to continue with our plans while still keeping the team safe. This was happening in Florida. And the and we are here in California, and many of the airlines were not operating, and so we had you know how do we get our folks say that need to be at the Cape? How do we get them there without um, exposing them to airports, et cetera? So we were able to use some NASA aircraft to fly our folks to and from can uh, to and from Florida if there was no other alternative to sending them there. So we were it was it was literally really touch and go as to whether we would be able to make the launch. But we did launch successfully. But one of the things that we added to the rover in the last minute was this plaque that is now on the left hand side of the rover. It is a tribute to the healthcare workers and all the other essential workers that allowed and still allow us to go about the work that we're doing by providing the basic infrastructure in healthcare. So this is a staff and serpent, the seal, the symbol of the medical profession with the earth above that as our way of saying we launched, we left the earth, perseverance left the earth at a time when the earth was struggling with a global pandemic. And we wanted to mark that and say thank you to those who were involved. So we were on our way and we are on our way to Mars. It takes seven to nine months to get there. And we are now right about here. So when you launch from the Earth, we're basically intercepting Mars in, in its orbit. And we do a series of trajectory correction maneuvers that will, that will point us to our entry site. And we've done TCM one, two, and three, and now we're in this, you know, less than uh, 40 days until landing since we land on February 18th. And then at the very end, as we get close, these, these maneuvers we may or may not have to do. It depends on how close our trajectory is uh, to where we are headed. And then comes landing day. So this was the video that you saw for a minute, uh, the one minute video that you saw. It covers what CNN still calls the seven minutes of terror. And, um, you know, I've been through this multiple times for spirit, opportunity, and curiosity. And, you know, it doesn't get easier. <laughs> you don't get less, uh, you don't get used to it. You never get used to landing on Mars. So we enter at approximately 20,000 kilometers per hour, right? We're going super fast. And we spend about the first four minutes through um, bleeding off airspeed as we go through the atmosphere. And then the parachute slows us down to a couple of kilometers per hour. So we go from 20,000 kilometers per hour all the way down to about three kilometers per hour that then uh, the descent stage lowers us the rest of the way. So as you can see, and as you saw from that video, there's a whole lot of things. There are a whole lot of things that have to go right, right? The parachute has to fire at the right time. We have to release the, the heat shield. As you can see, the heat shield shield's gone, the parachute slows us down, and then the descent stage, which is like a big jet pack, kind of flies us to the surface while it's firing its thrusters to slow us down further, 
and then we're deploy deploying the rover on a bridle and the wheels are deploying. There, there is just so much happening that that is why this is a very nail biting time for us. And this entire sequence is happening autonomously. The time it takes a signal, because Mars is so far away, the time it takes a signal to get from the Earth to Mars can be anywhere from five to 20 minutes one way. At landing, it will be about 11 minutes. So that means when we're getting telemetry back from what happened on Mars, it happened 11 minutes in the past, so, which is why this entire sequence that you're seeing has to be autonomous. We are not able to joystick the rover. This isn't like a video game, right? So everything is clocking out autonomously and we are watching what's happening and seeing each sequence of events continue. We will be landing in Jezero Crater. So you can see the different locations that we have landed on Mars with the different landers, rovers. And Jezero has always had an interest for us because it's this large crater, as you can see from this image, with what looks like kind of a delta, right? You can almost, I mean, you can, your mind fills it in, right? It looks like there was a river there once with a, a delta that emptied in to what we think was an ancient lake. So, of course, the scientists have been very interested in going to this location. But notice that this area is actually kind of close to the crater rim. So these conversations happen when the scientists say, oh, we want to go to this location to really to, to find out, to do our mission, to find out was Mars once habitable, did it have water, you know, could there have been life there? And the engineers, we've had to get better and better at our landing techniques in order to finally say, yes, if you guys want to go to Jezero, we can, our landing precision has gotten to the point where we can land within this ellipse and not you know, whack the side of the crater uh, given the uncertainty. So we have continued, every rover and every lander has made improvements in our landing capabilities. And in this case, we have more horsepower. We have more, uh, we have a, a computer on board this time that is devoted to processing information as it comes in. That helps us with our landing, uh, with our landing accuracy. And so there, so we continue to make improvements that help us land more accurately so that we can go to these locations that the scientists want to go. We have a really extensive payload that we're carrying. So this robotic arm, it's, it is huge. It is huge, right? It's like it by itself, if it were to stand up, is like the height of a person. And it is very, it, 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 it is a, it's a heavy robotic arm. But part of that is because of this incredible suite of instruments that we have at the end that we are going to be using to actually take samples of Mars and put them in, a t in this test tube and cache them. So we are carrying instruments from around the world as well as, so instruments that help us with the science, as well as instruments that prepare us for human exploration. This is MOXIE, uh, uh, which I worked on for a while. So MOXIE is an attempt to, is our, a prototype to learn how to extract oxygen from the Martian atmosphere, because the future astronauts will need that. And so we'll take the, the Martian atmosphere uh, and pull it apart into carbon monoxide and oxygen and get some experience. It's like a reverse fuel cell. So get some experience and how we're going to make oxygen on Mars. And, and again, I don't have as much time to go into all of this, but it's an example of the kind of inst uh, instruments and instrumentation that we carry that is not just for answering the science questions, but also for making progress on preparing for humans. Uh, to go to Mars. And check this out. We have a helicopter that we're taking with us. So this is, in fact, um, 
so the helicopter will base is basically stowed underneath the rover and then we'll drop the helicopter off and it will do now this is a technology demo okay so it doesn't have a science mission because this is the first time if this succeeds this will be the first powered flight outside of the earth's atmosphere this is like a wright brothers moment right can we fly in on another planet can we do powered flight on another planet so this is a very small helicopter kind of fits on top of your desk and you can even you can see from this picture what from this artist rendition of what kind of advantages this gives us because the rover kind of looks around at it at its uh human height Right, and we have orbiters that you saw in the first picture that in one of the earlier slides that give us the global context of Mars, but a helicopter that can go up some number of meters and literally allow us to look over the hill and get a good view of what's coming up that is at a higher resolution and a different angle than the orbiters can give us. So as someone who has worked on three rovers now, you know, I look at this and go, absolutely. I can think of so many times in Curiosity's 3000 Sols and Spirit and Opportunity when having a companion <laughs> like the helicopter would really help. And in the future, helicopter, you know, powered flight can be missions of their own. So this is a, a really significant part of our mission that we will do at the very beginning. So before we, we, we get going on our science mission, we will actually pause at the beginning, uh, soon after we land, after we've done all our checkouts, do uh, approximately five flights with the helicopter and then uh, get that technology demo part uh, demonstrated, and then we will go on with the rest of our mission. So we are super excited to have a passenger with us. And okay, I gotta finish up here. So I'll finish up with talking a little bit about working on Mars. So as I mentioned, the Martian day is approximately 40 minutes longer than the Earth day because Mars rotates at a different, uh, a different rate than the Earth does. So pre-pandemic, what you're seeing is what our control room uh, would look like. I can actually on landing date would have a lot more folks in it. So the mission control downlink, this group of people sees the information that comes from Mars on the day before, uh, or, or what happened on the SOL before. So a Martian day is called a SOL. And what happens in a in in the rover cycle is the rover will wake up at about 930 Mars time, Mars local solar time. And and it'll think, what shall I do today? Right. And it gets its instructions from the Earth. Then from about 10 a.m. to about 3 p.m. Mars local solar time, the rover will execute the commands that we have sent it. It will drive, it will take pictures, it will drill, it will do whatever the scientists and engineers have asked it to do. Then at about four, two, 2 and 4 p.m., an or orbiter will fly overhead, right? So the orbiter flies overhead, in, in, and there's about an eight-minute window. And in that eight-minute window, the rover will send data up to the orbiter. So it blasts a set of data up to the orbiter, and then the orbiter can send it home uh, itself with it because the orbiters have bigger antennas. That data comes to us at approximately 5.30 or so Mars time. And then while the rover goes to sleep to conserve power, we work the Martian night shift. We work at night. And this downlink room is the first group of people that will see the data from Mars and, and say, how did the last Sol or the last day go on Mars? Did everything execute as it should? Then in a different area, again, not going to look like this in the pandemic, but this was what these were the early days of curiosity. The entire science team was here. And so they then look at the data that we got back from Mars and now say, okay, what should we do the next day? So they plan based on the data that has been returned. 
So we will work for the first three months on Mars time. We actually come into work 40 minutes later every day, every Earth day approximately, so that we are synced up with the rover and can make the most use of the rover's time when we are first on Mars. And normally everyone is together and the team is getting to know each other as well as getting to know the rover. Except that is not the situation we are in. So we have all been working from home as much as we can. When, but as we get ready for landing, we are still landing. We are still, we are getting together. In fact, I will be going, what day is today? Tuesday. On Thursday, I'll be going to JPL for a dress rehearsal, right? When we're actually doing our full up simulations, the minimum amount of people that are required will go to JPL and, and do our dress rehearsal in person. An advantage we have is the Mars Curiosity rover is still operating on Mars. As I mentioned, it's Sol 3000. And in March of last year, for the first time ever, a rover was operated entirely from people's homes. We've always worked remotely on Mars because we're on the Earth. So now we're working remotely, remotely. Instead of being in control rooms together, now mission control is in people's homes and we work as a group to command the rover. So the Curiosity rover is the first rover to ever be operated on Mars where every single position is remote. Having a family of rovers, having a community of rovers makes a huge difference here because we are, as we, we're focused on landing, but also knowing how we're going to operate after landing has been hugely helped by the fact that Curiosity is operating remotely. Now, no one's ever tried to do Mars time when we are in our homes, so we face a lot of challenges, which I can talk more in the Q&A. But to reiterate, we are actually going to be taking Martian samples and putting them in test tubes for bringing back later. And why, why are we doing that? Why are we bringing back samples the same way that the astronauts brought back moon rocks? And that is because Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, as Carl Sagan would say. We're actually looking for biosignatures. And while we can gather samples from Mars and robotically figure out which are the best samples to bring back, the fact is we need the brain power and the capabilities of all of the Earth. We need not labs that fit into this size rover, but the instrumentation and the resources of the major universities and laboratories and scientists and engineers all around the world. So we will take samples and our science team will figure out, and this is a lot of pressure on them, right? Because these are gonna be priceless samples. They will figure out which samples to take and which ones we should bring back. And we'll put them in these test tubes and leave them on the surface of Mars, we'll in a depot. Then we drive off and continue exploring. The next mission called the Fetch Rover, which is launching in 2026, which is not that long from now, will come and pick up these samples, deliver those samples to a Mars Ascent vehicle. That Mars Ascent vehicle will take these samples, launch into orbit, and transfer the samples to a mission that will bring them home and, and enter through the Earth atmosphere, land safely, and then deliver the samples to the Johnson Space Center, which will contain them until they can be distributed. Sound complicated? 
Yeah, it is. Mars sample return is by far the most complicated campaign that we've ever tried to do robotically. When they're when with without people, it's much harder to do all of these steps. I mean, look at the multiple missions that it will take to get this information back to Earth. But what we are trying to answer is did Mars once have life? Are there is there definitive proof that it once had life? That is a huge question. That mission begins, or I should say the surface mission begins in like six Mondays from now. And I say that because that's what we're thinking about the amount of time that we have to prepare. It will be streamed as you saw in the video, we will be celebrating, we hope, with this planet, but mainly virtually. The advantage is that so much is being, that with everything being virtual, we hope we have the whole planet involved as it should be, because this is a mission that stands on the shoulders of the missions that have come before, and we are the beginning of a sample return mission, a campaign to bring these back. This is a global effort that I am very privileged to be a part of, and we hope it starts with a successful landing on February 18th. We are very excited and we hope you join us in this mission to return data for all of humanity. Thank you very much. As I was growing up in a, a you know, a culture, I, I grew up because I'm from India and, you know, in a multicultural household. And one of the things that became clear to me when I was very young was that there could be different expectations of what the boys would do in my family and what the girls would do. So, and of course, which made, I was like, why does it matter <laughs> whether I'm a boy or a girl? Like, and you know, my mother would say, oh yeah, you can do whatever you want. Um, but, so I was exposed very early on to the ways we divide ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Which we see in our country now, mm -hmm. the way we, we say, I'm different from you for this reason and, and the things that cause divisions. But I was also fortunate enough to grow up at the end of the Apollo missions and the beginning of the space shuttle missions. And, you know, that was back when we all watched TV together and read newspapers. And so I saw how the world literally gathered around their television sets, gathered around uh, sources of information and celebrated things we did together. So at the same time as I was seeing and learning about how we divide ourselves, I also was fortunate enough to see the space program mm -hmm. and saw how that brought the world together. So my teenage self kind of knew right away that that's what I wanted to do. And for me at that time, the astronauts were kind of in earth orbit or they were going to the moon, which you know, seemed kind of close to home. And at the time there were these robots, right? The Voyager spacecraft, the Pioneer spacecraft that were going a lot farther than the moon for the first time. And I thought, oh, robots. If you really <laughs> want to go where no one has gone before. And at that time there was the work in this area, robotic exploration, was concentrated at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. And I thought, that's where I'm going to work. And now we have many more institutions all over the world that are involved in robotic exploration. But at the time, that was, you know, back when, when I was uh, in school, that's where I wanted to target. I was able, I, you know, there weren't a lot of resources in my family for the girls' education. So I was extremely lucky and I got a scholarship from the US Air Force. And I loved serving in the Air Force, duty on our country. And I got excellent experience in space operations, but my teenage self wanted to get to JPL. So as hard as it was to do, I left the Air Force and joined JPL. And, you know, it's been 
25 years now. But what doesn't get old is working with a group of people to do something that matters for all of us. Mm -hmm. And given what we've all been seeing on our television screens, I just, I just, it brings us together. We have so much more in common than, than is visible right now to us. We need to look up and remember that we're one planet and we're certainly one nation. Where did the water go, right? We're talking about like 3 billion years ago. So the water basically either went into the rocks or to the atmosphere, right? Dissipated into the atmosphere. There have been, and, and one of the things that you have seen from, you know, rovers landing in 1997 and 2004 is these questions take a long time to answer scientifically. So we have now sent specific missions as we try to figure out, did it go into the rocks or did it go into the atmosphere? So there's a mission called MAVEN that, uh, that was 2013, and its specific job, it's an orbiter, is to try to figure that out from the atmosphere. So I will tell you that very early results, right? When I say very early results, I mean... The, these kind of results, it, take us, it will take like another 10 years for us to be sure, seem to indicate that the water dissipated into the atmosphere. But that is just the way kind of we're leaning at the moment. But it will take other missions to confirm that. So, you know, that all these things are lessons for us on the earth, right? Just because you have water doesn't mean you keep it. Right. So it's a reminder. All of these things are a reminder to take care of our planet. So this crater that we're headed for has the ability it. it so it looks like there it's a location that has clear evidence that there was once a river running into this this crater that le that left a delta that left material from the past that we have the opportunity to study now if you it, it's hard to find places where there's evidence that is still accessible because mars is now dry and cold and bathed in radiation because it doesn't have an atmosphere like it used to. As we've said, it's been dissipating. So the challenge for the scientists is where do we go to answer these questions? And the way we do that is we have these landing site workshops. So we'll say the question, where should we let, this is the hypothesis, where, where can we land on Mars to try to answer this question? And quite literally, scientists from around the world have ideas. Let's land here, let's land there. They, and they come up with something, we start with something like a hundred landing sites possible landing sites that have been proposed by the scientific community. And over the course of usually about four years, four different workshops once a year, scientists get together and they whittle down those hundred to the top 10 and then the top five and then and the engineers get involved by saying oh sorry we can't you can't land there we don't know it's too hard to land there and eventually engineering and science reaches a conclusion about where can we go that the scientists think has the best chance of answering that question and finally our landing capabilities allow us to go to Jezero crater where there's been so much interest in going for decades so great questions we expect to the earliest that we might see the samples come back because of those different missions that have to happen is approximately 2031 so we have multiple different instruments but basically so you know you think about like when you see scientists and and or uh, or miners and they're drilling into a location and they pull out like these cores right like these cores that's basically what we're doing is we are going to drill into rocks and the ground and pull out these cores and these cores are like a cross section of that area where we think that mine that sample might 
contain or it, it will contain information that might be biosignatures, like the evidence that life leaves behind, or provide key context. So first we, you know, we drive to an area, uh, the scientists have ideas of where they think we should go. It always changes when you get there, right? It always changes when you get there. And then we drive to the area, we look around, the scientists say, okay, there, that's where we wanna take a sample. So one of the hardest things about this mission, and JPL has, um, a history of doing things that are uh, that have never been done before and are 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 new and no one quite knows how to do it right and we have to figure it out is you have to take this sample and then you and again in 20 minutes i couldn't go over all of this but then you have to take all sorts of images of it so you have con you have to understand where did you take it then you have to seal the test tube right. and you're not just sealing it so it like doesn't spill you are sealing it so that it passes planetary protection standards mm -hmm. the space programs of the world have two types of contamination control one is to make sure we don't accidentally take something from the earth to another planet and say aha life when it was really from the earth right we we have a responsibility not to contaminate the <clears throat> the other world we're going to that's forward planetary protection so the the rover the helicopter everything has to be very very clean so we're not taking earth with us what we're talking about is backward planetary protection. That is when we bring something from another planet to, to the Earth. And that's why I said very specifically that the samples will go to <clears throat> the planetary protection facility at Johnson Space Center. The same one we use for everything that comes from and comes back from another world. Any robotic samples we take, any rocks that are brought back, right? And that's uh, and recently the the Chinese are bringing back some samples from the moon. Now they have their own facility, but uh, robotic they brought are bringing back rocks from the moon robotically. So that facility is responsible for ensuring that it is properly protected until we can ensure sure that there's no that there's nothing harmful there before we bring it out and start distributing it to the labs and universities of the world so we have to robotically seal that test tube so well that it passes planetary protection standards for this mission that's an excellent point and the prior um, Pathfinder, not Pathfinder, Spirit, well, actually Pathfinder, Spirit and Opportunity were all solar powered. And so solar panels is absolutely one approach uh, and Curiosity is solar powered. This rover, Perseverance, has nuclear power. Mm -hmm. So we are carrying a, a, a an RTG with us. And, and basically what that has is a nuclear material that is it is material that as it decays it's radioactive so as it decays it gives off heat and we're not talking about a lot of heat right but is it we have a thermocouple that will take the heat and turn it into electricity mm -hmm. right so these are still small amounts right think 100 watts think light bulbs right we don't it's not a ton of heat and so we convert the heat to electricity it's not a nuclear reactor Right, we don't have a nuclear reactor with us. We have radioactive material that we can then convert to electricity. And we use that electricity also to charge our batteries because we need batteries to keep us warm at night during the cold Martian night. Excellent point because we had talked about how there's not much atmosphere. Turns out there is enough atmosphere for a small helicopter to generate the lift that it needs, but it has, it has to be very light, right? The whole helicopter is less than uh, two kilograms, right? I mean, it's less than a couple of kilograms and it has long blades. So it has long blades that, and it spins, the rotors spin very fast because there is so little atmosphere for it to grab 
onto, but there is enough to create lift. So, but the, the fundamental physics concept is the same, that you have rotors and blades that spin and create lift from what atmosphere is there. So there is enough. The, the Martian atmosphere is like the Earth's at about three times the airliner. Right. So, you know, when you're when you're flying in an air, uh, when you're flying in a jet, then uh, that, you know, so it's about 100,000 feet is what the atmosphere on Mars is like ours at about 100,000 feet. That's an excellent point. How do we keep from, you know, security is an issue everywhere, right? Well, the, so from a security perspective, we also have uh, the, the signals are encrypted. They have certain, uh, they, they basically are packaged in such a way that uh, you need to understand what you're, what you're getting in order to decode that. We send our signals to the spacecraft and, and from them, we talked about the orbiters, but we use the Deep Space Network, which is an amazing set of antennas that are in Australia, Spain, and uh, here in California in the Mojave. And they are very big dishes that are big enough to gather the signal. But we, you know, we talk hacking occurs to us. But the other thing is also so you have this antenna that is sending out a signal and it's, you know, it's going in a certain direction towards space. But the first thing that we have to do is actually give it an address. So we take we take the signals and we package them. And, you know, so we've encoded them, encrypted them, etc. But we also have to address it so that one spacecraft, if the spacecraft is like, oh, you know, these orbiters, they're like, oh, look, there's a signal. And they're like, oh, wait, that's not for me. That's <laughs> not addressed to me, right? Because there is a spacecraft ID, right? They're all kind of going around Mars. And, and so the first thing that we have to do is address it to a particular rover or orbiter, because Mars, thankfully, is getting kind of crowded with spacecraft um, Oh, you know, I didn't say that. There are, we're not the only mission landing. We're not the only mission arriving in February. This is the first time that the Middle East has sent an orbiter to Mars. We helped them with it. And so there'll be a Middle East orbiter and a Chinese mission all arriving in February. So as Mars gets more international and more spacecraft, that's, we, we think about hacking, but we also have to first just say, no, no, this is intended for you not for that other rover or not for that other spacecraft. So it's a little like, you know, you're what we do. We, when we send a, when we send a, um, uh, a letter or something digitally is you have to first get it to the right recipient. I think this and the virtual environment that we're in does give us an opportunity for something that might have had folks locally dial in <clears throat> or say, oh, well, there's too much traffic, you know, to drive. And instead to, so virtual has its advantages. The museums of the, the country and the world are critical in helping the youth of our country and the world see themselves in it, right? I've had the opportunity to tell these stories in other countries. And I gotta tell you, there's nothing about a border that changes brain power, right? We're all humans. There is there's potential and capability in people from whatever background they're from or whatever country. Ideas don't stop at a border and say, you know what I mean? We, and, and that mission that I described, the Mars Sample Return Campaign, you know, good heavens, we need the brain power of the whole world to pull this off. And, you know, I've been in countries where it's a, a lot, you know, a lot of times the, the, it's mainly one particular group that does engineering and science. Often it's the guys, right? And I'm like, uh, there's half the population that has ideas that we need. So we have lots of, of problems and challenges to solve. And that requires everyone. And so I think the more that stories are told and the more that we see different kinds of people on the screen, the more that uh, anyone, someone who's young can look at what they're interested in and, and see support, 
the more that they will be likely to come join us. Um, one thing I will reiterate is I was very fortunate that my mother was extremely supportive. And when you ask yourself, what can you do, no matter what age you are, it, you can support, it only takes one person to support another. Yes. Right. So every one of us has the ability to encourage people around us, kids around us and adults around us. But Discovery Cube is critical to this entire process, as are the other museums and institutions by bringing us together so we can share stories.